history of medical advancement is marked by bursts of revolutionary changes in how humans have altered in their perceptions of the natural world. In many cases, these changes were noted with the emergence of new theories and the annulment of others. Everything from the causation of disease to therapeutic strategies were points of debate and change. Was a disease due to a spiritual affliction, a failure to appease the gods, or even the result of being targeted by magic? Or was a disease due to imbalance in the bodily humors, injury, or some other natural causation? Were certain foods, exercise, prayers, or rest the best therapies after all? These are some of the questions that people have asked over the centuries, and in some cases continue to ask today. The cultural framework of the medical domain greatly influences these perspectives, and it is no wonder that strong opinions and perspectives on science and medicine have varied both across cultures and periods of time. No field of medicine quite illustrates this point as well as that of infectious disease. Although we currently live in an era of broad acceptance of the germ theory of disease, the idea that microbes can invade other organisms and cause disease, this was actually a revolutionary concept that took centuries of experiments and observations until it was accepted. For example, while people could observe the spoilage of food in the home environment, there was very little understanding of how it happened. This is most evident in the theory of spontaneous generation, which is the idea that living things, such as worms or flies, arose from non-living things, such as a cut of meat. Strongly held belief in spontaneous generation hampered advancement in the understanding of the transmission of infectious disease for centuries. And this is despite the efforts of a number of talented scientists who worked to disprove it. For example, in the late 17th century, the Italian physician Francesco Redi tested this idea with an experiment in which pieces of meat were placed in jars that were either left open, covered in gauze, or closed with a cork. The flies laid eggs on the meat in the open jar and on the netting of the cloth covered jar, but not in the cork covered jar. And so you had no maggots appearing there. He also meticulously illustrated the development of a fly through these observations of insects as shown in the image on the right. However, this work did not dispel this theory. Francesco Redi's simple and yet elegant experiment of meat in jars with different levels of air exposure should have put the argument to rest, but additional tests went on until the 19th century by Louis Pasteur and John Tyndall, whose experiments with sterile broth exposed to air eventually resolved the matter. Here you can see how Pasteur's experiment worked. First, he boiled broth in different swan-necked flasks. If left open to the air, but without ease of contamination to particles in the air, the broth remained sterile. If the neck was broken off or the flask tipped sideways such that particles could make contact with nutrient-rich broth, then the microbes could take hold and grow. Evidence of careful observations regarding the transmissibility of disease do appear, though, much earlier than the 19th century. For example, biblical laws regarding basic sanitation and the necessity of burying solid waste or fecal materials have been in place since at least the time of Moses. The Hippocratic Corpus, which dates to around 400 BCE, also describes a number of sanitary and surgical procedures that indicate a good understanding that disease could be transferred from person to person through inanimate objects such as clothing. Vero, who lived from 116 to 27 BCE and was a great Roman scholar and polymath, proposed that tiny animals entered the body through the mouth and nose to cause disease, which was a revolutionary concept at the time. Miasma theory was introduced by Galen and expanded upon the humoral theory of the Hippocratic corpus. Um, the and the miasma theory of contagion, this proposed that infectious disease such as cholera and the Black Death or plague, which is depicted here in this 16th century painting, were caused by exposure to a noxious form of air or a miasma, which emerged from decomposing organic matter. And it was especially linked to the night air. This concept was prominent from the Middle Ages through the mid-1800s, and while it was one small step closer to germ theory, it didn't recognize the role of microbes, nor the role of specific microbes in disease causation and spread. In the Canon of Medicine, which was written in 1025 um, Common Era, 
Avicenna elaborated on the miasma theory of contagion by drawing links concerning the transmission of disease between people through the breath of sick people linked to symptoms of tuberculosis and even through water and dirt. While it may be hard to believe that it took nearly 2,000 years before Vero's concept of tiny animals being responsible for certain diseases to be developed into germ theory, that is what happened. Much of the delay was due to a lack of technology enabling humans to see these tiny organisms with their own eyes. This required a technological innovation like the microscope. Robert Hooke refined the design of the compound microscope and was responsible for coining the term cell to represent this most basic unit of life in his book, Micrographia. As a master craftsman of glass lenses, Antoine van Leeuwenhoek made single lens microscopes and was the first to begin exploring the world of what he referred to as small animals, which we know today as microorganisms. This Dutch businessman and self-taught scientist was the first person to ever observe and document microbial life forms. He was also the first to observe red blood cells, spermatozoa, muscle fibers, bacteria, and more, opening up a whole new field of scientific inquiry. For this reason, he is known as the father of microbiology. Although the paradigm shift of recognizing that microbial life abounds was certainly transformational, this did not necessarily take hold in the field of medicine. It required an additional two centuries of research and observation by both scientists and physicians. In his work on the diseases of silkworms, French scientist Louis Pasteur made groundbreaking advancements in developing the association of specific microbes with specific diseases. And around the same time, his German contemporary, Robert Koch, developed the methods to grow bacteria in pure culture, enabling experiments with microbes and animals that led to the development of the four postulates, known as Koch's postulates. And these basically state that you have to find the specific causative agent in every case of the disease, the disease organism must be isolated on its own, inoculations of the sample of the culture into a healthy susceptible animal must produce the same disease, and the disease organism must be recovered from that inoculated animal. Now, while they were doing this fascinating work in the laboratory and hospitals across Europe, however, most physicians weren't yet aware of the implications of these findings or simply didn't see the relevance to their clinical practice. And so even before these findings were published, the Hungarian physician scientist named Ignaz Simmelweis was making his own observations in the clinic. While working in an obstetrical clinic in Vienna, he became particularly concerned with purpural fever, which is um, also known as the fatal disease childbed fever caused by Streptococcus pyogenes, which can affect women following childbirth. Women assisted by physicians were actually dying of the disease at three times the rate of those assisted by midwives. A rationale for this difference in mortality came in 1847 when he drew a link between postpartum exams or autopsies that physicians were conducting on dead mothers and the spread of new disease. You see, hand washing was not a common recommended medical practice at the time, and doctors were infecting healthy women going through childbirth with the infected materials from women that had just died from the disease that was still on their hands and clothes. So Semmelweis advocated for a revolutionary practice of hand washing with a solution of calcium hypochlorite. We know that today as chlorine. And he recommended this be done between autopsies and patient examinations. And this actually resulted in major reductions in deaths due to purpural fever in his clinic patients. However, the normal practice of hand washing as we know it today, especially in a hospital setting where it's really expected, this was not the case at the time, and his opinions strongly conflicted with those of his peers and the medical establishment at the time. Other doctors not only rejected his ideas, but were also offended at the concept that their hands could be responsible for the death of their patients. Now, in Britain around the same time, there was a surgeon named Joseph Lister who was also facing pushback on his ideas concerning antiseptics. His interest concerned infection and wounds, and through applying Pasteur's advances in microbiology and learning of the use of creosote, which is a byproduct of coal tar, 
um, in treating sewage, he got curious about the use of another coal tar product known as carbolic acid. It's also known as phenol, and he was interested in its applications as a chemical antiseptic agent. And so he ran a number of tests on medical instruments, wound sites, and his own hands, and found that the use of this carbolic acid solution, which he also dispensed using this um, sprayer apparatus, that it actually helped to reduce the incidence of wound infections like gangrene by a lot. And this shift towards aseptic surgical technique earned him the distinction of being known as the father of modern surgery. 30 years after Lister's death, a Scottish microbiologist made a curious observation of a zone of clearance in growth where a speck of mold had settled onto a petri dish full of bacteria. Alexander Fleming's observation of the activity of Penicillium notatum and the subsequent years of research undertaken by him, as well as Howard Florey and Ernst Chain, would eventually lead to the game-changing discovery of penicillin, opening the gates to the golden era of antibiotic discovery. This also marked a point in the shift of the survival of patients afflicted with infections ranging from purpural fever to syphilis, strep throat, gangrene, and more. It also coincided with an era of discovery of active substances from plants and the movement towards single compound magic bullet drug approaches and away from those more holistic health strategies that concern the diet, rest, exercise, and the use of whole medicinal herbs. So if there are any lessons to be learned from 2,000 years of scientific and medical advancements highlighted here, perhaps the most critical one is the recognition that even when we humans think that we know all there is to be known about our health, we really don't. There are vast amounts of knowledge that await discovery and development. Paradigm shifts also take time and great amounts of human ingenuity, careful observation, and persistence. So for my challenge for you today is to look for other examples of paradigm shifts in science or medicine. And also, are there any major shifts that you could predict for our future?